Okay, so this is one of the topics uh, I've been uh, reading about and, and learning about for the last uh, 20, 30 years maybe. And it all started, uh, well, let me first say what, what I would like to cover. Uh, some of the issues like the grading and the scaling. Um, M4, is that now actually, is that a good result? In some articles you see that they present M4 as being an excellent result after tendon transfers or after nerve transfers or, or whatever. So I would like to have a little um, thing about that. And relations with dynamometry, how do they relate? And how can we use manual muscle strength testing in combination with dynamometry? Synergism, I think, is very important to understand when we're talking about manual muscle strength testing. What's the value of the quick test? And um, this is one of my hobby horses. Uh, let's coin pointing finger and band hand of Benedict. If that will be the only result of this talk, uh, I will be very happy that you agree with me. <laughs> but this all started uh, some time ago uh, when uh, my dear friend Wilf Bransma came to uh, Thailand, where I worked at that time. And he was working with Paul Brandt in, in America uh, at the Carville uh, Hansen Disease Center. And uh, in Hansen Disease, you do a lot of hand muscle testing because it's a, it's a neuropathy. And so that was part of our, our, of our job to, to do the manual muscle strength testing uh, to see if the treatment was adequate uh, and so on and so on. And by doing that, we also determined that yes, you can uh, uh, do the manual muscle test and the testing in a reliable way. But there was this article some time ago. And at that time, we also uh, came up with this suggestion that also gravity is not to be taken into consideration. Gravity, the weight of your finger, is not, not that important. Like when you're doing a quadriceps testing in the hand, that, that's, not, uh, that's not taken into consideration. So then you end up with grading 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And three is, I think, a very important one to understand that you have normal range of movement. So the muscle is just strong enough to have a, a normal range of movement, but there's no resistance. If you go below that point, two, there's a reduced range of motion. So that means these joints are at risk. The muscles that work uh, in, with these joints are at risk of developing contraction because they cannot produce full range of movement, uh, like in three. And then uh, in one, there's, there's no movement and there's only some contraction that you can feel or can see. So that, that's uh, how we uh, thought for that mental muscle strength testing in the hand would be uh, um, the best way of doing it. Remember that MRC numbers don't represent numbers. That is a con contradiction, but we seem to forget that. Sometimes you read articles and they talk about, talk about the average um, uh, grading. Well, you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, because they are ordinal variables and the intervals between the numbers are not equal uh, because they don't represent actual numbers. And this is what it looks like when you do a dynamometry of, in this case, for the hypothenar muscles. Uh, you see that the, uh, this dynamometer is pulling on the little finger and in that way you can determine the strength of your hypothenar muscles. In ulnar nerve, of course, very important. And then in the grading, uh, three, four, five, you see that three grading, this is newtons. Uh, the average will be about 11, 12 newtons for the grade three. Four will be somewhere close to 20, and five average will be somewhere around 34, 33. Um, so if we, and in a, in a uh, thumb abduction of the thumb, uh, we did a similar, of course, the, 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 the numbers are much higher, the strength is much higher. So M4 result represents, in this case, about 40 to 50% of the actual strength when you measure that with, with a dynamometer. And if that's good or not, uh, it's, it's up to you to determine uh, and to decide on that or not. But remember, grade 4 is not very close to 5. It's, it's only half of 5. Eh? And if you look at um, uh, representation on, on a scale uh, where MRC is 0, 1, and 2, of course, it's very close to uh, say 10%, then you've got say, grade 3, and the largest part will be grade 4. So grade 4 can still be very weak and can be very strong, but uh, that, that is grade 4, and grade 5 will be around here. So your dynamometer really comes into um, use when you're uh, up to grade 4. Grade 4, you don't see a lot of changes anymore because it represents a, 
quite a large part of the scale. You need a dynamometer here to determine changes in, in muscle strength. And the, the manual muscle strength test, of course, there's nothing else in the 0, 1, 2, 3 area. You can't do dynamometry here, so you only have the manual muscle strength testing. So keep that in mind when we're talking about grading of manual muscle strength testing. The other thing is when we go to practice, I often watch these, uh, these uh, television programs where on, they have a hand injury and, well, the, and everybody starts pushing uh, for testing the muscle strength. They, 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 they watch if that, uh, what the strength is. And I would say, don't start with pressing. Uh, I would like to present this step-by-step -step approach uh, where you don't start with pressing for resistance, but wait for that. And it will look like this. Again, hypothenar muscles, you push the, the little thing out passively. And so you, you know what the range of motion is. And remember that range of motion was important in the grading. So now you see the patient is able to hold it and then you start pressing. Only when you know that the patient is, is able to hold that finger or thumb in that maximum position, you know it must be a three or more. And if, it's, if they can hold it, that's when you start pressing, right? Here for the first dorsocentrosis, they can hold it. Ah, they can hold it, and then is when you start pressing. And then you decide, is this three, four, or five after pressing? If they can't hold it, then you know it must be less than a three. So step one, position the finger or the thumb or the wrist in a maximum passively achievable position. Then you tell the patient, hold it. Again, that's easier than when you say, move your thumb up or, or put your, your fingers out. It's easier to say, okay, this is the motion I want, but you only have to do is hold it. And if they can hold it in that position, you know it must be, or if, sorry, if they cannot hold it, you know it must be less than a three. And then you look for, is there some movement? It will be a two. If there's no movement, but you see some contraction or you feel it, you know it's a one. If there's no movement, no contraction, you know it's a zero. If they can hold it, then you start giving resistance, and then you determine if it's, it's three, just about can hold it. There's some resistance, it's four, or it is as strong as the other hand. If the other hand is normal, then it will be a five. So that, that would be my suggestion to do it step by step. If you look at muscles in books, uh, they look awkward. <laughs> but uh, especially for the hand therapist, uh, uh, this is this is how we learn how, how muscles uh, uh, look like. But a lot of things have been left out of here, as, as you can see. Uh, and it tells us where the origin and the insertion is, but it's, it's missing out on some very important tissue. Uh, and, and it makes you uh, believe that muscles work in, in isolation. And that, that actually is not the case. Muscles in reality work together. There's synergism. Uh, and only very few muscles, therefore, can be tested in isolation. For example, the flexor pollicis longus, there's only one muscle that can flex the IP joint of the thumb, and that will be the flexor pollicis longus. The first dorsal is the only muscle that will radially abduct the, the index finger. And all the other muscles, we have to really keep in mind that they work together with other muscles, and I give you some examples of that. So usually we're not testing a single muscle, but we're testing a movement. And you have to keep that in mind. So don't, uh, if you look at this, this uh, muscle, you think, ah, there's only one muscle uh, working out here, but that's not the case. Um, and this is a nice uh, graph from, from this article where you can see that, that if the muscle is, uh, is, is passive, is not working, and the red muscle is active, and this muscle is pulling, because of this, that, that connection, that connective tissue between the muscles, that will cause uh, also movement in this muscle. You see the elongation of that muscle just by pulling on this muscle. And this became very apparent when they were looking at the flexor carpial nares as, and they were transferring the flexor carpial nares, for example, in uh, CP uh, operation for, for children with CP. And they found that even after cutting the flexor carpal nares and they stimulated, electrically stimulated the flexor carpal nares after it has been cut, it still gives wrist flexion. And that to many is, is a big surprise. Um, by cutting the nerve, there's still possibility of wrist flexion after you cut the nerve because of the connections 
between the muscles, they can still, the flexor cranials can still transfer that, that uh, forces to the other muscle adjacent to the, the uh, paralyzed or, or cut uh, muscle. So something to remember that muscles also on this level work together and can also cause problems or can cause uh, 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 or give advantages uh, for working on of that particular muscle. So um, I'd like to, to go step by step by all the, the different muscle testing and I follow the innovations of, of the muscle and I would like to start with the median nerve innovative muscles and start with the intrinsic ones. So that's the low median nerve uh, problem at, uh, at the carpal tunnel, like in carpal tunnel uh, syndrome and look at these particular muscles. So when we uh, think about carpal tunnel syndrome, of course, testing that muscle is, is something you want to do uh, because when there's weakness, uh, you know that that, that nerve has been, has been entrapped for a longer time. Uh, and that tells you to, to hurry up uh, in, in decompressing uh, that, that median nerve in, in the carpal tunnel and not sort of wait and see uh, approach. So it's, it's important to have a proper testing of that, that uh, abductor pollicis brevis muscle for carpal tunnel syndrome. And this is, this is a, a video from BMJ and you see they're pressing on, on the thumb, but what actually is the direction they're pulling? Um, many mistakes are made by uh, doing testing of, of this muscle. And remember that if we would be pulling on the, uh, the abductor pollicis brevis in isolation, that would be the action we're looking for, which I call palmar abduction of the thumb. Uh, and that's the isolated action of the uh, abductor pollicis brevis on the thumb. And of course, like I said before, there's many more muscles active in that in this action, uh, but this is this is the abductor pollicis longus action. Also important to remember, look at his hand. This is a long-standing low median nerve problem in a patient with uh, with leprosy, and you see he has full palm abduction of the thumb. And notice, by the way, uh, the the absorption of of the tip of the thumb and the atrophy of the index finger. That tells you that, that this is a long-standing uh, median nerve problem. And you see the atrophy of the abductor pollicis brevis, but still a full palm abduction. So without uh, abductor pollicis brevis, you can still have a, a full palm abduction because the flexor pollicis brevis is a synergist, especially in the case where the flexor pollicis uh, brevis is innervated by the, uh, the two heads are innervated by the ulnar nerve. Sometimes you would, uh, be, uh, be not know the patient will not notice the weakness of the thumb and will have a full function in the palm abduction uh, uh, movement. And so that's something also you have to be aware of. This was an interesting uh, thing that happened to me when I was working uh, in, in, in Thailand. I had the students from the university come in to learn on this manual strength testing. And so uh, I, I had several students test uh, one hand and then this one hand uh, um, was tested by several uh, PTs and OTs and, uh, uh, and they came back and reported and say, oh, one said, this is a very strong hand and the other said, it's very weak. And they were testing the same hand. And I, and I wondered what, how uh, they tested differently that they had this different outcome. And so as you can see, the difference was that the wrist position, if the wrist was allowed into a little bit of flexion, the, the, the palmar abduction of the thumb was much stronger. Uh, on top of that, if the wrist was put into extension on the same hand, there was hardly any palm abduction possible. So what was happening over here uh, at the wrist that, uh, that, that, that created such a difference? Well, look at this hand also. This is a lady with a, a neuropathy, the charcot Mary tooth a disease with weakness of, of, the, uh, of her intrinsic muscles of the, of the fingers and the thumb and see if she, if she is putting her wrist into flexion, helping a little bit with her other hand, she can maintain the position, but the moment she moves her wrist into extension, it collapses. And the, uh, apparently something is changing here, what is pulling on the thumb. And most of you will know that's the abductor pollicis longus. So inflection 
of the wrist. The abductor pollicis longus is, is just about at the right position to pull on the thumb into palm abduction. If the wrist goes into extension, that APL will be on the dorsal side of that uh, abduction, uh, abduction axis. So it can no, no longer uh, produce that palm abduction strength in wrist extension. Same to this patient with a, a, an ulnar median nerve lesion and recovering. He also found that uh, in the wrist flex position, he was able to pull on the thumb into palm abduction, but the moment he goes wrist into extension, he loses that ability. And maybe you know that in, uh, in ulnar nerve lesion, you have the, this called uh, G um, Thomas sign, yeah, where, where there's weakness of the intrinsics, and so they will put tension on the uh, intrinsics by pulling on their um, EDCs. This is the, the, the same maneuver, the tick movement. So they put the wrist into flexion, so the APL can have just the right uh, angle and uh, just a little bit of, of, of uh, pulling on the thumb in the, into this palm abduction uh, movement direction. So but apparently, uh, keeping the wrist into extension, you, 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 you uh, have the APL uh, not working at that CMC joint. So if you want to test the APB in as much isolation as possible, you want to keep the wrist into extension. And then uh, if you want to press, press at a point that you can find very easily, and I, we would suggest to, to press at the MCP joint. And what you're actually doing is pressing the thumb back towards the, the palm of the hand, the plane of the hand. So that is the direction where you want to test the abductor pollicis brevis. Yeah. Um, my colleague Paul de Burk, uh, um, he has this patient where ulnar median nerve uh, were uh, lacerated at the biceps level. So there were no intrinsic, no extrinsic muscles of the ulnar median nerve. So there were no flexes at all. And then we looked at the hands and said, ah, we think that the flexor carpi radialis is working. Uh, so that, that would be a sign of recovery of, of that nerve. But looking a, a little bit closer, we saw it was not the flexor carpi radialis, but uh, it was the abductor pollicis longus. And so she was moving her thumb to move her wrist into flexion. And that was the APL was doing that. So that APL has a lot of function, even on the wrist. Uh, so keep an eye on, on the APL when you're doing manual muscle strength testing. Um, fortunately, the patient now is recovering in her FTPs and uh, okay, we're waiting for the FCAR also to get stronger. Um, testing the opponent's policies. This was in a, in a Dutch article on the carpal tunnel for uh, general practitioners uh, as, a, as a way of testing the opponent's policies. Well, as you can see, that's not the way you should be doing it. It's one of the here, yeah, you're probably testing your flexor pollicis longus. It's a difficult one to test, and patients often, uh, they don't have the, the coordination to not use the flexor pollicis longus in, in this uh, way of testing. But they should keep the IP in extension, and when you press, you press on the inside of the thumb, uh, again, close to the MCP joint, but then on the folder side. So APB will be 90 degrees in this direction, and for your opponent's policies, it will be in that direction. But remember, isolation of that opponent's policies is impossible. There's a lot of synergies working here. And uh, again, for some patients, it will be very difficult to uh, isolate that from the FPL, uh, flexor policies longus. Uh, talking about the extent, uh, the, uh, the APL, abductor policies longus, um, that will have its main action on the CMC joint. Um, I often see patients with CMC arthritis that they have to collapse and they, ha they have lost that ability to extend the CMC joint, uh, pulling on that APL. Um, so that, that APL also comes in. APL is, is a stabilizer of that CMC joint uh, when it's still a normal uh, curvatures. APL lesion. Um, I think it, they, they can be missed very easily, like this patient, it, it, it was missed. Uh, he had, a, he had a, a cut at, uh, he was working in his, his uh, garage and, and he had a, a standing uh, knife that cut, a little cut at, at the thumb base. At the first aid department, they asked the patient to move the thumb. He said, oh, your, your thumb is moving quite well. So 
you're lucky you do not have any uh, tendon lesions but then it uh, then uh, what happened this patient was he was playing water polo and he was not able to hold that that ball with one hand what he used to do so he came he said i, I I'm, i've lost some function of my thumb and then uh, he was sent to us and then we found his apl was not working anymore and you can see quite a good extension still but he has lost some extension of, of the thumb which for him was was an impairment of, of that thumb and the other thing we noticed in his hand was that when he was extending his thumb his epl was pulling of course but his epl was not able to move keep the thumb uh, on top of, of, of that CMC joint, so it moved into adduction with a, with a click uh, because that missing APL, uh, he was not able to stabilize that that uh, metacarpal at the uh, trapezium. So um, let's move on to the median nerve innervated muscles, and we start at the elbow level. So we're looking at FTP, FDS, FPL, and FCR. Uh, last week, uh, Shrikant had a beautiful presentation about the biomechanics of the hand and he also mentioned the quadrica phenomena phenomenon uh, which uh, you know uh, of this four chariot uh, where we know that the fdps are having connections between the tendons uh, so the one horse cannot move in one direction verdun was the one who uh, coined that term uh, and it's telling us that the fdps are interconnected they cannot move independently so when we tested them, it would be better to, to ask the patient to make a full fist. And then one by one, you can, the FTP, you can test the FTP strength by pulling them into extension and see what the strength is. Um, so that uh, here you can see that the quadrica phenomena is talking about the four FTPs. But if you look at this video, I'm pulling on the flexor pollicis longus here, you see in isolation, these are all the FTP tendons, and see when I'm pulling on that FPL tendon, all the fingers move into flexion, right? So, um, and that of course was already found uh, decades ago by Lindbergh Comstock, uh, who found that there are, in many people, there are connections between the flexor pollicis longus and the FTPs. And that is also relevant when we think about treating patients with FPL lesion, that if they have connection, you also want to be sure that they're not pulling on the on the index finger too much, because that that might cause uh, tension on the sutured uh, FPL. And uh, reverse, if there's an FTP lesion and it's repaired, you want to be sure that they're not pulling on the FTP too hard by pulling on the FPL. Or you make use of it, of course, when you want to have more flexion, you have also the FPL into flexion. So in some patients, the uh, the, cortica, the, uh, the chariot is having five horses, uh, where the FPL is the fifth horse. And in some patients, they have really independent movement of the index finger, and they only have three. So there's, there's natural variation between patients. This patient was referred to us, and the surgeon thought he had a, a flexor tendon lesion of his index finger. No, you can see why he was uh, thinking about it. But if you look closer, well, it's good to look a little bit closer. You can see the little uh, band-aid on, on his index finger and on the tip of his finger. You see the thumb in full extension, no flexion whatsoever. You can see a little bit of atrophy there. And then we, uh, then uh, I think most of you will know that this is a high median nerve lesion, and this is what it actually looks like, Nine, 99 out of 100 patients with a high median. This is what it looks like. And don't believe the textbook that tell you anything else than, than this. If you have a patient with a high median nerve lesion that looks different than this, I, I would be very interested to receive that video and the pictures, uh, because in my, in my experience, it's, it always will look like this. And we wrote a, an article on this last year uh, collecting some very uh, interesting patients. And we, the, the, the importance is that these patients that we reported on, they were missed. The high median nerve lesion was missed because at the first aid department and even at the neurologist, they did not recognize the high median nerve lesion. 
So knowing your muscle working, um, I think is very important. And the question is, is high meter fellas, is the hand of benediction or present a correct sign? Well, the answer is, is no. Um, and even in, in this, this kind of uh, poster, beautiful posters, on the median nerve, they still talk about the benediction. Uh, and I think it, it, it is very wrong. And we should abandon that term uh, from now onwards. This is another patient uh, on the video. There was a, a tumor taken away at a median nerve. And you see the typical uh, uh, moving of the finger. The middle finger is into flexion because of the connection, because of the quadrica phenomena. That thing, if you would test that middle finger, you would find it's weak. Uh, but they, uh, the connections make that the, the middle finger, the synergism and the connection the, uh, between the, the tendons will create a flexion of that middle finger, often a full flexion of the middle finger. Again, if you test it, it will be weak, but there's full flexion of that, of that middle finger. The index finger will be straight. Also, because the intrinsics are still working and they give MCP flexion and IP extension. So that's also the reason why it will look like this. Uh, and uh, and uh, again, it will it, it will never look like like a handle Benedict because the uh, first of all the introsi are giving flexion of of the MCP joints, um, and in this case, and and the uh, middle finger will be flexed because of that that connections. Also, watch the thumb. There will be no FBL function, and the thumb will be will be next to the uh, the index finger because there's no thena muscles working. So, let's. Uh, I would say pointing finger is the best um, term to use for, for this kind of um, uh, lesion. And if we, if we start talking about pointing finger from now on and never talk about handle Benedict, uh, I think uh, people will start recognizing it and sending in uh, patients for proper treatment rather than uh, anything else, right? So the, the quadrica phenomena also helps us in that we can isolate the FDS working at the uh, at, at the fingers, uh, and that um, because we are keeping the, the adjacent fingers into extension, um, then the FTP will not be able to work on that finger in between. And so we can test the FDS in isolation. Flexipolis is longest, um, easy to test, and like I said before. That is a very isolated muscle testing. There's no other muscle working on that, that IP joint than the flexor pollis longer. So that's an important test for, uh, for uh, muscle function. Because of that connection effect, a little sidestep toward dynamometry, uh, testing the FTP of the index finger and the flexor pollis longus, dynamometry is, is a beautiful tool that will give you quantitative data. Uh, so, um, yeah, if you are really following up on patients and looking at outcome, you probably want to use the dynamometer. But remember, if you're keeping the finger straight or in flexion, there will be a significant difference. You will be much stronger, and maybe you, you should test it for yourself, that if you keep your fingers into flexion, uh, you'll be much stronger in your pinch grip. Uh, and that's because you're making use of the connections of the other fingers with that FTP of the, of the index finger. In this case, you're making it the FTP a little bit diff more difficult to work on, on that uh, uh, FTP of the index finger. So you'll be weaker. Yeah. Um, you see a lot of uh, videos on, on, on the internet, um, also uh, on nerve decompression of the median nerve, and they're using this, this test. Uh, I think if you want to prove that, that the outcome of this kind of surgery or, or therapy or whatever, I think it's okay to find the patient where there's weakness as a sort of screening tool. But if you want to uh, um, prove your, your, the effect of, of your treatment, I think you, you can't do without dynamometry and especially the, 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 the dynamometry for the pinch. Uh, that gives you beautifully uh, statistics uh, as you can use uh, the kilogram force or your Newton forces uh, to uh, as, as quantitative data. So uh, yes, this is a nice screening tool for a quick test, but it's not a good tool for uh, proving your outcome of, of uh, nerve decompression or whatever. Uh, use your dynamometer. Flexocarpi radialis uh, is also sometimes used for, uh, is of course used for median nerve uh, 
problems, but uh, Flexocarpy ADL is there's many synergists, um, and it's it's difficult to isolate the Flexocarpy ADL is from the other flexors of the wrist, uh, and you 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 can't do without uh, uh, feeling the tension on that uh, tendon to uh, really be sure that the Flexocarpy ADL is, is pulling, and also feel the tension to determine the strength. Grading will be very difficult. So often you end up in saying it's strong or it's weak, uh, but, but not, not much more detail than, than that. So uh, the ulnar nerve innervated muscles, um, we go back to the FDPs again and the plexicarpi ulnaris. Plexicarpi ulnaris, um, uh, similar to the plexicarpi radiators, uh, important muscle, but grading is, is too difficult. Uh, you must feel the tension very similar to the plexicarpi radiators uh, to uh, determine if the flexocarpi ulnaris is working, yes or no. Um, FTPs, uh, very similar to the high median, of course, you have the patient hold or squeeze your hand and then you can uh, pull uh, the, the fingers into extension, the fourth and the fifth, to determine their, their strength. And here we have another uh, effect of the Quadica phenomenon that in high ulnar nerve lesions, patients can make a pretty good fist. And if you look carefully, you see that the only thing that's lacking is DIP flexion of that, of that little finger. Here, the reverse of, of the median nerve, here the ring finger is pulled into flexion because of the connections with the middle finger. And only the DIP of the uh, little finger will be in extension because of the ulnar nerve lesion. Of course, when the, this patient has a missing FDS, uh, there will be no intrinsic, there will be no FDS, no FTP, so then the, the little finger will be completely straight. Um, and that, that, of course, also can happen. So the last part uh, for the ulnar nerve is a low at the, at the wrist level. So we are, now we're looking at the lumbricals, dorsal and palm introsius, and the adductor pollicis. Lumbricals are sometimes uh, also patient uh, or in, in, in chapters or in, in articles. Um, uh, they show that, that you can test the lumbricals, uh, but here again, um, they cannot be tested in isolation from the introsia muscles. And the introsia muscles are, are the stronger ones, are the, really the, the, uh, the workhorses. Um, um, there's one exception, of course, when we have an ulnar nerve lesion. Then we have the index and the middle finger where the lumbricals are still working. Uh, and then the, all the introsii are, are, of course, paralyzed. So we did, with a dynamometer, we, we measured the strength of the lumbricals, now in isolation from introsii, and we found that then there's only 12% what the lumbricals can uh, provide in, in, that, in that intrinsic plus position. So also telling us that the lumbricals are not the workhorse of, of, of that uh, of that intrinsic plus position, but it's it's the introsii. Going uh, on to the first dorsal introsii muscle, um, that again is a beautiful muscle that can be seen very clearly, can be felt very clearly, and also uh, it's the only muscle working on that index finger into radial abduction. So, yeah, put the finger in that position passively, and ask the patient to hold it. You can observe. If you do it in this way, you can observe very nicely uh, how the uh, first dorsal introsis is, is, is active. And of course, it's one of the last muscles of the ulnar nerve uh, to be uh, recovering after ulnar nerve lesion. So in isolation, it's very useful to, for example, look at how the, uh, the nerve is progressing of, of, or uh, healing. Uh, functionally, it's much more interesting uh, to look at intrinsic as a group. So I have the dorsal and the palm introsis and the lumbricals testing as a group. And then it's this intrinsic plus position where all these muscles are active, where you ask the patient to keep the finger straight in the MCP flexion. You say hold it and you push at the PAP level into the dorsal direction. And then if the, the, the finger buckles, it, it, it flexes very quickly, then you know there's weakness. If they can just about hold that PAP into extension, it will be an MRC3. If there is some resistance, it will be four or five. If they cannot maintain it, you know it must be less than a three. So no use of pushing or pressing. You know it, it must be less than, than, than three. And if it's less than a three, 
of course, they are in danger of developing a flexion contracture at their PFP joints. So you want to do the exercises and maybe splinting to prevent flexion contractures. Also, hyperthena, holding three fingers, I think, makes it the patient very easily. The only finger they can move is the little finger. You pull it out, you say, hold it, and then you press at the PFP level to determine the strength three, four, five. The Froman sign is, 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 is another uh, screening test, uh, not, not being invented for uh, grading, but it gives you um, the, uh, it gives a way that there's a weakness of the adductor pollicis. Uh, by asking the patient to hold a piece of paper and pulling on it, then you, the only thing you have to do is watch the IP joint of the thumb. And if the IP is flexed, then you know, ah, the adductor pollicis is weak. If the IP is still straight, uh, then you know uh, there's a, a, an active and a strong adductor. And the only thing you can say about it is, is if it is a plus or a minus, don't, don't grade these kind of uh, tests. Uh, it's only used for giving away the IP flexion or extension. Um, and it's also not, not a sort of grip test where you, where you pull out the, the paper and grade the, the amount of strength. No, you only have to do is watch that IP flexion. And then you can, uh, oh, this is another one that I saw, that it tests the adductor muscles, but there's a lot of extrinsic muscles active in that adduction. Uh, the, the extensor pollicis is longus, the flexor pollicis is longus, they both also produce adduction force at the CMC joint level. So testing the adductor in, in isolation, not possible. Look for the Froman sign. And if the IP is flexed, you know, there's weakness, and then you go for the dynamometry. And the dynamometry, again, will give you a quantitative data uh, of your adductor policies. So, yeah, that, that, that dynamometry is, is, is a valuable tool when you're looking at um, uh, manual muscle strength testing, but then muscle strength testing with a dynamometer, yeah? So finally, the radial nerve innervated, and it's those four. Extensor carpiators, lungs, and babies, they cannot be uh, tested in isolation of each other. Um, so test them as a group. Extensor digitorum communis, this was a video in Primal Pictures where they said this, this is the action of the EDC. Well, it's not. And so uh, be critical about what they present to you. This, of course, is a combination of the EDC plus intrinsics. If you want to test the EDC in isolation, you want to test it in this way. MCP extension is only one muscle extending the MCP joint, that's the EDC. So you want to test uh, MCP extension for strength of the EDC. And remember, the extensors are positioning muscles, and they're not, uh, the flexors are really the, the, the strong muscles. The EDC are not the power houses, it, the positioning muscles. Extensor pollicis brevis is also interesting muscle, that's the, the muscle that will be responsible for extending the MCP joint of the thumb. Some persons are born without, and then you get a congenital clasped thumb as a deficiency of the EPB. Sometimes these patients are operated for a trigger thumb, but that's not the problem. Uh, it's the problem is the weakness of the extensor pollicis brevis, secondary developing into a flexion contracture of, of the MCP. And of course, trigger thumb can do the same, but the, 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 the origin is, is much different. Trigger thumb. Extensor pollicis longus. Um, yeah, also sometimes uh, I see that the IP is tested, IP extension of the thumb is tested for EPL. Uh, look at this patient. Uh, she had a distal radius fracture. Often, or sometimes I should say, that we see an EPL rupture. But uh, this is the same hand, and you can see she has, she has a good IP extension of thumb. She can extend the IP of the thumb with her uh, theta muscles. And so testing IP extensions is not a good test for EPL function. Um, and what's this video here also? Normal hand, uh, EPL ruptured. See, there is some uh, difficulty extending the IP joint here, but when they move into this position, this is difficulty, no full extension, but here they have full extension. So that's not a partial EPL lesion, uh, it's a complete EPL lesion, but in more flexion of the MCP, uh, the intrinsic come in and they also extend the IP joint. So testing EPL 
uh, lifting a thumb from the table is is uh, a very easy test. If they can't do it, uh, then you know there's something wrong with the EPL. Um, okay, so that was my talk. Uh, if you are more interested, uh, Wim Bransma and I wrote a chapter in uh, that ASHT clinical assessment recommendations that can be found here, and all the muscle testing can be found on YouTube uh, if you look for, for this link.